Hi everyone, this is Martha. I am a relationship counselor and clinical sexologist. Together with Carol Gockel, we are bringing to you Bear All. In Bear All, what we are doing is we are introducing people, amazing people, to talk about what's happening in their lives. Hopefully, we get into what's real and what's raw. We get under their skin and hopefully they share their stories with us because we believe that through stories and through our lives, we can illuminate and bring light to certain topics. Um, together, collectively, as a society, we can begin to support one another and to heal and transform. So without further ado, get Carol to introduce herself. Hello everyone and thank you Martha. I'm so pleased to be co-hosting this series Bear All with Dr. Martha. I'm Carol Gawker. I'm a confidence coach and change maker. So if you are able to, you can get, get to me, get to know me, get connected with me on www.carolgawker.com. Back to you Martha. Thanks Carol. And today I'm very, very excited. In fact, really excited. <laughs> to welcome Sangeeta Lender. She has this podcast uh, called Soul Sutra and actually several people mentioned her to me and I was a bit inhibited. <laughs> uh, so until the third person mentioned her, then finally I reached out uh, <laughs> to ask her to talk more about her work. Uh, so yeah, maybe I'll get Sangeeta to introduce more about her podcast and her work. Hi everyone, uh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you Martha and Carol for having me. I'm so excited. Um, it's the first time I've done any work in Singapore and I'm very familiar, I love Singapore. I lived there for a bit, family lives there, so I love it. So this is so exciting. My name is Sangeeta Pillai. I run a network for South Asian women called Soul Sutras. Um, the point of the network is to talk about the taboos in our culture, South Asian women. So there are so many things we don't talk about, sex being a big one, sexuality, periods, sexual harassment, menopause, you know, there's just anything to do with sex and our bodies. There's a big problem and taboo in our culture. So my job with Soul Sutras is to change that. Now, as part of Soul Sutras, I run a podcast called Masala Podcast. Uh, it's been going since October. So I've had one season, nine episodes, and it's already been nominated for the British Podcast Award, which is a massive deal because I'm a new podcaster and I'm next to people like BBC Asian Radio and things like that. So super excited. Uh, and again, the themes are each episode, I interview another South Asian woman who's doing amazing work and I talk about a theme. So for example, the first one is around the body, shame around the body, how we grow up when we're taught that our body and our sexuality is shameful. So we carry that conditioning as we grow older. Then I've had mental health, which is another risk. So each episode is an interview and a theme. And on each episode, I talk about my own personal life because I grew up in India. I grew up in a very traditional Indian family. Uh, I was the first woman in my family to ever go to work. So that tells you kind of how traditional it was. So I had to fight to cut my hair. I had to fight to meet boys. I had to fight for everything. So I talk about my experiences within the podcast as well. So that's what Masala Podcast is. Um, I also run something called Masala Monologues, um, which is a series of writing workshops that I've held in London, uh, which then got turned into two pieces of theater, which you'll see on my website. So women come together, South Asian women, we write stories, we open up to each other. Then I take that and I get actors and directors involved and I turn it into theater. So that's something I've done uh, in the UK. And I just finished a um, session in the Salah Monolog at the University of Berkeley. So they invited me to come to work with their South Asian female students. And that was fantastic. So we did a video, we did workshops, writing workshops. So that's kind of the gist of what I do. Mm. Well, that's really amazing what you're doing. I think uh, Carol and I are really blown, blown away. You can see from her face and also her, her message here in in private yeah. chat. Anyway, um, so what what uh what uh Soul Sutra is is actually not a podcast. It's much more than that. So I'm glad you clarified that for me because sometimes when I read stuff, half yeah, of it gets we all in. Do it. <laughs> yeah. So all I'm do it. I'm I'm so proud of you and your work. So can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Are you uh, born and bred in London or originally from India? So I have lived most of my life in India. Uh, from the time I was zero, when I was born, to uh, 15 years ago when I moved to the UK. So I have like an interesting mix of 
proper Indian traditional culture, which is where I come from, and now, now British Asian culture. So I'm a mix of British and Indian now. Uh, and I feel like I have the best of both worlds. So I can understand where the taboos come from because I'm part of that culture. And I can see what we could become as well when we kind of start talking about this. So that's my background. So mostly Indian, a little bit British, mostly mixed up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think a lot of us as, are at a crossroads because we, we are exposed to much more cul culture, um, different cultural references. We have to be out and about. And so we have a lot more exposure and education than our parents. So some people really feel that as they get older, they can't really relate with their parents. And I'm glad you have taken onto yourself to really advocate for um, sexuality messages and conversations for South Asians because actually uh, Indians are everywhere around the world and I do have colleagues who have difficulties understanding Asians in uh, coming to their practice so I have colleagues in um, Australia in the US in UK telling me that they have difficulties understanding uh, Indians because uh, there's so many of us uh, so many Indians uh, all over the world, uh, Chinese, whatever, but I think specifically Indians because I guess with how competitive it is in India, a lot of people are migrating and leaving India and um, the cultures, the upbringing that we had still continue to influence us. So I'm just curious because of what you're sharing, is, is your work mainly uh, South Asian women or also men? I so I feel like the issues are particularly among South Asian men and I directly that's what I'm passionate about like that's I feel like my life's work what I was born to do is this talk to other South Asian women uh, so whereas men come into the picture but I don't focus on them they're my secondary audience um, because the thing I think what you talked about earlier really resonated with me so if you grow up in a culture which from a very young age tells you your body is shameful, your sexual organs are shameful, you're not going to be able to enjoy a healthy sexual life. How is that going to happen? So say for some years, you might say, oh, I'm going to explore my sexuality and date people. But when you get older, the conditioning that you are carrying from the time you're two years old kicks in and it becomes problematic. There are so many people I work with because I get a lot of ages in my workshops, like 20 year olds, 18 year olds, you know, 50 year olds. And it's incredible how it's the same themes that come up over and over again i'm ashamed um sex is a taboo um i don't know this thing happened to me like how do i rationalize this or particularly in the uk um there's a lot of conflict between being say indian or pakistani or bangladeshi the, the original culture which people identify with and then to operate in the world, they have to lie to their families because they can't really tell their parents maybe they have a boyfriend or maybe they have a black boyfriend. You know, there's a lot of uh, racial stuff as well. So a lot of people lead double lives, which we did as well when I was young. You led a double life because you couldn't tell your parents what you were actually doing. So it's complicated. But what is really interesting, it doesn't matter if you live in India. It doesn't matter if you live in Singapore. It doesn't matter if you live in the UK or America if you're Indian or South Asian, it's the same things you struggle with within all of those cultures, balance, taboo. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I don't, I, I may sound very ignorant, okay, but uh, I, I guess this may be a question that other people will ask also. When you say South Asians, uh, of course, I assume India, but are there other uh, areas like Pakistan, Bang Bangladesh? Yeah. Them? Because yeah. these are yeah. also the clients that I get to see also. Absolutely. So the South Asian subcontinent, which is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal even, I think, it all comes under the same South Asian. And it's a simple shortcut way to say people from these countries. Because if I say Indian, a Bangladesh, you might say, oh, I'm not Indian. What, what are you talking about? Do you know what I mean? So it's one way to, to collectively refer to us as the yeah. South Asian culture. Yeah, great, because I, I do have clients from these areas and I, I somehow intuitively felt that their cultures are very similar, even though I, I don't want to assume. Um, I don't want to assume, but it, it does sound very similar from the way they talk to me and relate with me. 
So do you feel that it's also very, very similar for all of them? It is very similar. And it's, it's funny for me, like coming from India, because, you know, India and Pakistan have a difficult relationship, right? Always have. We're always fighting each other. But when you come out of, <laughs> come out of India and come to the UK, it's exactly the same. Yeah. The food is the same. The, the, the expressions we use are the same. Are and this and that, you know, it's a very, you know, it's Indians and Pakistanis do the same thing. The taboos are very much similar. They don't talk about sex. We don't talk about sex. You know, they don't talk about periods. We don't talk about periods. Do you know what I mean? So there's a lot of similarities. So if you put an Indian and a Pakistani and a Bangladeshi in a room, we would have more in common than you can imagine. So it's very similar, I find, in my experiences working with the people that I work with. Absolutely, yes. Wow, I mean, I, I, when you explain it this way, and I, I realize that, you know, I, I guess in, uh, in, in the UK, you know, people who look like, like myself or Martha will be, all right, or will be referred to as Orientals. Yeah? Yes. And, and, yes. and uh, our upbringing is mostly the same as well. I mean, for us, you know, for me, sex is like a dirty thing growing up. And you know, wow. it's best not to talk about it as well. And uh, if the men talk about it, it's, it's good because it shows that he's actually macho. But if even women woman talked about it, you know, she's a slut, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, based on what you have shared, you are so amazing, so strong. It's like, how, 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 how do you find time to do this? You know, this I mean, I, I'm sure you have a very busy schedule, right? Besides, besides doing, doing uh, Soul Sutra, is this your only work? So for me, this is very personal, right? So mm -hmm. I used to work in advertising and marketing for 20 years. So I worked in Singapore, that's what I did as well. And in India, that's what I did. And in the UK, that's what I did. So I'm a creative, I'm a copywriter, marketeer. But the more I started to do this work with the workshops and the, the women, the, everything else just faded. And I quit my full-time job to, to do this now because I believe this is so important because what this does is when we don't talk about these things and when we don't enjoy our bodies and sex and, and it's an absolute calling, exactly. Um, it damages us deeply. It doesn't allow us to engage fully in this wonderful world that we live in and these beautiful bodies that we've got, you know, they're capable of so much pleasure, but because of all of this conditioning, we don't get into those places. So I feel like it is an absolute calling. This is my life's work. This is what I was born to do. So I've, quit everything else and this is soul sutras is what i do full time now um yeah it's terrifying but it's also super exciting yeah and I, that is also fulfilling for you as well I can oh my see god it's radiating out of your eyes oh thank you so much it is it, it is what fires me up like it's what gets me out of bed in the morning it's what keeps me working like in the night and i'm like you know it's just it's not a job. This is kind of my calling. This is what I was born to do. So it doesn't feel like work. And to connect with other people and to sit across say, a room full of other South Asian women and see it in their eyes when I've said something, they're like, oh my God, yes, you've heard me. This is something I have felt for 20 years and no one's allowed me the space to say it. It's everything for me. It really is. It also makes us feel less alone, I think, when we share these things. When we sit across and we talk to the women and you think, oh my God, you know, I have felt this. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for giving me space. And I feel less alone and they feel less alone. And that's the point of this work, I think. Yeah. I mean, the thing is that do you, do you normally work with, uh, with the South Asian living in the UK or do you work with, uh, with, with them outside of, of UK? Uh, outside and inside. So because, what, like I was saying, the culture is the same root culture. Uh, it's the same kind of language, um, not just the language, but the words and the problems and the taboos are the same. So I've done a lot of work in the UK. Most of my work is here. But uh, the US, I'm just starting to explore. So I, like I said, I did the University of Berkeley. And it was fantastic, these young women. So they're American South Asian women who are second, third generation. And we sat across and we had these wonderful writing workshops. Uh, I can send you a video actually, and you can see what it does to them. And they are lit up and they're, you know, like happy to have that space. So I'm doing more and more work in other countries now. So the US and Berkeley have asked me to do another workshop this year. I'll do that. Uh, I want to do some more work in India. I want to do some work in Singapore. Everywhere, basically, that there are South Asians, Canada. So a lot of people get in touch with me on social media as well. 
So there might be a South Asian group of women working in Canada and they'll be like, oh, do you want to collaborate? So, you know, there's a lot of um, opportunities, I think, in any country that has a South Asian female population. That's what I do. And more and more, that's what I want to do because uh, I'm launching episode season two of my podcast in September. And I'm going to do some PR work in India and in Singapore and in the U.S. Because, again, it's a collective experience. It's not just a British experience or an Indian experience or a Singaporean experience. It is a South Asian female experience. Do you think that uh, you, you are able to do the work that you do because, you know, you are you're no longer uh, living in, in India and because you're living in the UK, that that gives you the freedom to be able to do what you're doing right now? You know, that is such an important point, And I have thought about this a lot. And I say this to my Indian friends as well. Absolutely. I think this is the best of both worlds for me, where living in India, you are still as a woman expected to live within the boundaries of society. Like people will, you know, it's changing. You know, there's amazing, uh, I don't know if you've seen, there's a film called Lust Stories uh, on Netflix, which is created by Indian directors, which is full of four stories about female sexuality. I mean, who would have thought, right? And there's a woman having an orgasm on screen, right? In the fourth story. It's incredible. So there is change in India, but it is slower. Uh, whereas what in the UK, you ha I have the freedom and the space. Like no one standing outside my door calling me sluts. Do you know what I mean? Because of the work I do. Which ha might happen in India, there is judgment. I think still as a woman, uh, why are you not married? Why haven't you got kids? You know, all of this kind of, kind of putting women in boxes still happens in India. And it is a little bit, I would be more worried, I think, in India if I were doing this kind of work. Whereas in the UK, I have all the freedom and I can say what I want and do what I want. I can go to BBC and I'm talking about the female orgasm, you know, and that's okay. So definitely, I think this has given me the freedom to do this very important work, which maybe I wouldn't have in India. It's a lot harder, I think, for Indian women. Mm. Yeah, I love what you are sharing. Uh, and actually, you're right, Carol asked a very good question about how... Uh, uh, leaving your country of origin actually helps you to also find your voice and expression and freedom and then you can go back to India and support people because actually nowadays with this uh, virtual real, uh, virtual uh, with technology we can actually connect yeah. virtually yeah. Uh, through podcasts yeah. and podcast yeah. goes everywhere so yeah. what I know of um, uh, my clients in India is that there is a very definitive segregation of male female roles and also yeah. male female spaces so of course i know india is a huge place and it's separated to north and south and so they would um, do things a bit differently um, but uh, those people who do uh, practice segre segregation what i also notice um, not not in all cases but in some cases there's uh, there's rape of uh, men to men and uh, assault and also um, quite a number of my clients actually have arranged marriages so is this uh, something that is still happening could you speak a little bit to that what you have to understand about India is there's always two or three different types of Indias right there's the urban India where women have a lot more freedom uh, they're living in with their boyfriends they're exploring sex all of that then there's kind of smaller towns and villages, which are still kind of the old fashioned way. So yes, arranged marriages happen all the time and they have for centuries. Um, and I don't think that in itself is problematic. So I refused to have an arranged marriage. My parents were trying to get me married off when I was 18 or 19. I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. Um, so, but while by itself, the marriage concept isn't that complicated. It's like going on a date with somebody your parents had set up for you, you know. Uh, so that's not problematic. But what is problematic is that within in the arranged marriage scenario, women have no power. So you get married off from your parents' house. You're living in your parents' house and they're training you to be a wife. Are you a good cook? You know, do you know how to respect your elders? You know, all of these things are what you're being brought up to do. And then you go to your mother-in-law or, you know, your husband's house. And then you don't get the space to be who you are or grow or develop as a woman. And you definitely do not get space for sexual expression. That's such an alien concept. So yes, um, arranged marriages still happen in India. Rapes, as you know, are very, very prevalent. We have been named the most unsafe country, I think, to be in the world by a study a couple of years ago. That says a lot. 
Uh, and even me, when I lived in India, you know, until what, 15 years ago, you get sexually harassed every day on Indian streets. Every single day, some man will try and grope you. And this is the reality for most women living in India now. Unless you're protected by money, you have a car, so you don't need to get out. But if you're using public transport, if you're out in the streets, people will try and touch you up and things like that. So I do feel that we still have a long way to go in India in terms of female emancipation and feminism and giving women the right to be who they are and you know express themselves. So definitely, I think we have a long way to go, I think, in India, definitely. You mentioned that you were in India growing up until 15 and uh, as somebody who is uh, finding her way, uh, reaching puberty, was India, uh, uh, of course this was back then, was India a very scary place uh, for women and do you feel that that is still the way right now? I, I know you just mentioned like it's not very safe and all that, um, but growing up, how, how, how did you feel? Oh God, it was uh, really difficult. So I lived in India until I was, I think I moved here early 30s, in my early 30s. So I was a child there. I was a teenager there. I went to university there. I did my first three jobs there. So, you know, quite a long time. But the time that I grew up, and I'm old, so I grew up in the 80s, right? <laughs> um, so my experiences were, it was very difficult. So every time I stepped out of my home, I had to kind of protect myself. I would have this handbag, right, here, big handbag. So otherwise, a man would just touch my breasts when I walked out, right? Any man would just come and grope you. This was every single day. To go to college, I had to get into a bus and a train. As you get into a bus, somebody touches you up. You know, this is every single day. And it's not just young girls, older women, you know, who'd be wearing saris and traditional women, people would try and touch them up too. So it's a mindset and it is a, a very sad reality, I think, in India growing up as female and young, you are vulnerable, you are very vulnerable. And I might get black for saying this, but this was my experience. Things are changing a little bit uh, in that women now have a stronger voice. So if somebody comes and tries to touch you up, you're like, what the hell are you doing? Which we used to do as well. But I think, unfortunately, until you change people's minds, until you change this kind of unequal power balance, which still exists in India. Women don't have as much power, don't have as much right. And a lot of men still think she's a woman. I can do whatever I like to her. You know, until you change that mindset and you change it across the board in villages, in towns, in cities, this is not going to change. This is why we see the prevalence of rape and sexual harassment in India like we do. So I would love to say that everything's changed now since I was a teenager, but I'm, I don't think it has. I think women still feel unsafe. Uh, in fact, when I have uh, friends from the UK who visit India on trips, I, and I always tell them, it's a wonderful country. There's just so much to see. It's, it's just amazing, right? And I'm not just saying that because it's home for me. It, it genuinely is. But I always tell female friends to be careful to say, you know, don't sort of, if a man invites you out, like, don't just go, you know, be careful which I wouldn't do in a Singapore, like Singapore is very safe. You know, you could walk out at two in the morning on your own drunk and you'd still be okay. And London's pretty safe as well. And I go out, you know, it's, it's pretty safe. Obviously there are lots, there are issues in any city, but as a woman particularly, I feel vulnerable in India more than I do anywhere else. So sadly it hasn't changed. Yeah, I don't know what to say to that because it's really heavy <laughs> and I feel scared, you know, I have been to India three times and I was scared and because I look different, right? I'm, uh, it's very obvious that I'm not Indian yeah. Um, yeah. because of my skin color and it, there's almost this, uh, this assumption that because you're not from there, you are fair game. Yes. Because Absolutely. you must be, you must be open-minded. <laughs> they don't Absolutely. even need to know what I do for a living. They just look at me yeah. and then they think that yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't we can't touch our own people, but we can touch you. <laughs> I get so scared. No, of course you would as a woman. And so imagine like someone who's blonde as well, like say he's, she's a you know British blonde girl. Again, a lot of men would assume like because you look different, they look different. It's like oh, they're fair game. They're open to sex, but they might be open to sex, but they're not open to sex with you, some random person on the street right? It's the, 
it's the privilege, I think, that men are brought up with in India. A lot of men are brought up, and not everybody is like that. I must add, there are lots of educated men who are fighting for the women in their lives to have equal opportunities. But there are still a lot of men in India that say, I'm a man, I can have you if I want it. You know, it's that kind of attitude. And yeah. I'm a man, so I'm stronger, I'm bigger, I'm more powerful. So you're just a woman. You know, it's this yeah. kind of, and you feel it on the streets. I, yeah. I'm sure you did when you were walking yeah. around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're, like, this, you're like this yes. kind of. It's this male privilege and entitlement that was, they were brought up, that they were the superior gender and they can just take because I'm, I'm you know, just by default of the fact that they were born a man. And so it creates Absolutely. so much, so much rage inside us as women, like the hate of being born a woman is tremendous. So, you know, you were mentioning the back thing and being, being groped. Like, how do you deal with it? Like to make sure that you, 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 you stay sane. How did you deal with it? I'm sure people you know will what? be wondering. You know what we do as Indian women, particularly Indian women at that time in the 80s, you know, when something is part of your everyday, you just accept it and you think, oh, this is normal. Do you know what I mean? So the way I dealt with it, I was very angry all the time. Like I'd be like, even, even before a man on a street would reach anywhere, I'm like, oh, you know, like I would get really raging. And you see this among a lot of women like traveling on the streets or in trains. They're really, you know, their body language is really like this. PTSD, exactly. It's a trauma, trauma response, right? Um, so you get kind of, angry because that's the only way you can protect yourself and you're angry all the time and it comes out in different parts of your life because if you don't feel safe we, we know what ptsd and trauma does like i suffer from ptsd so i know your body goes into this like weird fight of life response you produce adrenaline you're like on high alert all the time because we don't feel safe and it's a terrible thing to do to half a population of a country isn't it like why and what did we do to deserve it, you know? Uh, and I think you mentioned, so the, the way I dealt with it is I didn't, because I didn't know how, I think. And I don't think any of us knew how. We just kind of, something happened, then we tried to deal with it, you cried a bit, but you couldn't stop going to college, you couldn't stop going to work, you couldn't stop functioning, right? You can't sit at home and say, oh my God, I'm too scared to go anywhere. That would be defeat. So we carried on, and I think, Personally, it's only much many years later, and now that I'm in my 40s, I'm processing these things. And I'm thinking, my God, growing up like that was damaging. Growing up being broke every day is damaging. It's horrible as a woman, and it still affects me. Yes, it absolutely does. So even now, like I, I see myself. So if I'm walking in London, I'm not so mindful. I'm like, just relax or whatever. But if I was walking in a street in Mumbai, and I go back a lot because I have a lot of friends and I have family, I'm very guarded. My body language is very different. And I'm like, okay, who's around? Who's around? You know, like it's this kind of uh, fight or flight response yeah. that we're Hyper vigilance. Hyper vigilance. Exactly. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. So it's unfortunate. Um, and this is, but this is how we survive. We survive by not talking about it. This is the other issue, I think, among South Asians where we don't say it. So all of this stuff is happening to us, right? And it creates these trauma responses that are very strong, that affect every aspect of our life. But we never, I don't remember ever sitting with other women and saying, oh my God, you know, this guy groped me on a train and I feel horrible and I've been crying for two days. Nobody's, there was no one to tell. I couldn't tell anyone. I wouldn't tell my mom. I wouldn't tell anybody because it just feels shameful like you've done something. In fact, there's a, in the Sala monologue, there's a whole monologue I've written, uh, mm -hmm. which is about this. I was 11 or 12 and I was going to school. I was really young. And this guy sitting next to me on the, on the bus, he was like in, an, in, a uni, in like an office clothes, so, you know, respectable man. He started touching my thigh mm. on a bus. I was 11. And I remember like, I felt horrible and I, I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know why. I didn't understand why it was wrong. I was very naive. I was a young girl and I had no exposure. I remember walking out of that bus and I wrote the whole stories about that and just crying because I didn't know what to do. But I couldn't tell anyone because it just felt shameful. And that shame we carry in our bodies, I think, forever, that doesn't go away. That shame then attaches to our sexual self. And that's so sad because our sexual self should exist without any of this crap that other people have put on us. Do you know what I mean? So I think 
yeah, and there's a lot of dislike for men and distrust and hate for men. It's like, oh my God, you're a man, I don't trust you. And that's so sad even for the men, right? Because we want to be able to be able to be free and talk to them and love them and respond to them. But with the trauma we carry in our bodies, it's very difficult. Oh, I can I totally hear what you're saying. And I can I can only imagine, you know, this is actually ma making your work a lot harder because you know, as 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 a woman growing up uh, in, in India, I can imagine, you know, they they have they have to protect themselves. And then they, they still have to think about how to get in touch with their own sexuality. So it's like there is on, on one hand, you have all these attacks for men and disrespect. And then on the other hand, you know, you want to explore a part of you that is that is inept, that's in, inside of you. And how do you actually help your client to actually to marry these two so that they are they can be balanced? I think it's very difficult. And I think for me personally, I can't talk about other people, but I think all that time when I lived in that environment, my sexual self was very hidden. It was something, and also the way we are brought up as, as girls in the time that I grew up in India, your body has to be guarded your, you know, from men. And you look after your body and you protect your body and you're doing it for the man you're going to marry, right? So your sexuality and your body isn't even your own. You're guarding it for the man and you're protecting it from all these men who are trying to attack you. It's only for me that I got to my 40s. Um, I moved to the UK and I've been here for a while and I was single. And that's the first time in my life as a 40 year old that I was like, oh my God, you know, my body is capable of this. My body feels pleasure. And this is actually good for me. Sex is good for me. Orgasms are good for me. And what a wonderful body we have as women, you know, like capable of all of this stuff. But it was very hard. And I think it takes a lot of unlearning of the things we've been taught. Uh, sort of all these messages that we've been taught as young girls to say, actually, yeah, they told me all of this, but none of that is true. You know, to say, and that is very hard. It's stressful to say all these messages that my I don't know, my mother, my aunties, grandmothers have told me that society has told me is actually wrong. Um, there is, my body is wonderful, sex is wonderful, pleasure is wonderful, and it is good for me, and I can own it, and I can control that. And it's got nothing to do with these men or society. It's a hard, it's a really hard transition for a lot of South Asian women, and it was for me. I think for me, it was more about kind of feeling safe for the first time, then exploring my sexuality, reading about a lot of it, um, reading things like the Kama Sutra was incredible. Because if you ever read the Kama Sutra, it is about female pleasure and male pleasure. It is about women having sex and men having sex, women taking lovers, men taking lovers. So there is no, um, this disparity that exists in Indian culture now didn't exist in 400 BC when, or fourth century BC was it? I get the dates wrong. Um, so there's a huge focus on female pleasure okay, in the so, Kama Sutra. So I'm, I'm very curious, um, you mentioned Kama Sutra, but how about Tantra? Do you, do you learn all these things? Do you practice all this? So I don't practice Tantra personally, but I am very interested in it as an idea. Um, mm -hmm. The Kama Sutra I've read a lot because I, I'm just mm -hmm. very passionate about the book. And I'm passionate about it because I want to tell other South Asians that this is our culture as well. This is where we come from. We were talking about sex in the fourth century. We were talking about female orgasms and pleasure in the fourth century. You know, that this is our culture. So let's take the bits that work for us from this culture and not just all these other messages we've been fed. So that's why I'm like a really big fan of the Kama Sutra and talking about it a lot. Um, Tantra, I love as an idea. I have never personally explored it myself, but I've read a lot about it. And again, I love how as a concept, it is not about the orgasm. It is not about sex being this like, you do A, then you do B, and then you do C, and everybody goes home. You know, there, it's a deeper thing, and it's kind of channeling sexual energy. Um, and it's kind of, um, I don't know, spending two hours touching somebody rather than just focusing on an orgasm. And I think that's the joy and the power of sex. And sexual energy is a thing. You can feel it in your body. Um, and if you can channel it, and if we can, as women, and I think, own it, it powers us up. I think if you think about, I don't know, a time in your life when you've had 
a great sexual experience, right? And you walk out and you feel this kind of like your hair swishing and you're like walking and you're smiling and it's, and that's sexual energy. That is pure sexual energy that transforms us. So it just lights us up, I think, you know, uh, every part of us. So it, it isn't just, that's what I love about Tantra, I think. It isn't just like the sexual organs or, you know, it's not that. It's a full body experience and it can be a spiritual experience, I think, from what I understand. I don't know too much about Tantra, but it's channeling that sexual energy to, to be better people, to be more evolved spiritually. And I can absolutely see why that, that would work. I mean, what, what really hit me earlier was when you described what you, what you went through sitting on the bus. You know, that, that was such a traumatic experience. And I, I have been inappropriately touched before, and I can totally relate to what you're saying. And you know, do, you, do you feel angry about the episode? You know, how I, yeah, you did. And yeah, I did do. You, and did I feel, you, what, what did you do with that anger? What, what did you do with it? I, yeah, so for me personally, the work I do is the channeling of that. Like, I think all the work I do. So I write, I'm primarily a writer. So I write about my experiences. I'm writing a book as well at the moment about the things that have happened to me and why I do the work I do. So I channel it into that. And I also take that anger and that rage to power the work I do with other women. So when I'm sitting in a room, when I'm recording a podcast, it powers me up, I think. So yes, there is rage. And I remember feeling a lot of um, grief, I think, because I was a child. And now I think about it, I feel really sad for that child. I'm like, what did an 11-year-old girl deserve for some random 40-year-old man to just grope her like that? What gives you the power or the, the, the audacity to do that, you know? Um, so it makes me angry. It makes me sad. I think that women have to go through this a lot. But anger is, is not very useful unless you channel it into something. So anger by itself is self-destructive, I think. But I channel it. So I'll, you know, as you can see, I'm very excited talking about <laughs> these things. So I take that and I put it into the work that I do. I put it into the podcast that I do. I put it into the writing workshops that I do. I put it into the book that I'm writing and it powers me up. And I think then it's a positive outcome of that rage and anger and grief. Uh, and then I'm helping other people to process their emotions. So it feels like a positive channeling of something that was negative, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, so through your podcast, you are uh, shedding light on this issue and um, demystifying sex and you have different guests and uh, how, how are you then uh, going to make money from this so that you can continue to do this work, monetize it, you know? So there's something very exciting, but I can't talk about it right now. Uh, so I'm getting sponsored um, by a company. I, I'm not allowed to talk about it now, but I will put it on my social media. Uh, and it's quite a you know, big name. So that then allows me to carry on doing the work that I'm doing. Um, and what's been wonderful about the podcast, and because I do various avenues of work, you know, I'm doing the writing workshops, I'm doing the theater, I'm doing the podcast, I'm doing the books, events. The podcast feels like the most authentic way for me to be putting my message out there. And it has got the most amount of responses. Every day I get women writing to me to say, oh my God, I was in my car and I listened to Masala podcast and you talk about this thing. Oh my God, I didn't know we could talk about it. You know, uh, I get women writing to me to say, oh my God, um, I wish, you know, I had something like this when I was growing up. You know, so people really resonate. I've got hundreds and hundreds of messages from women I don't know just writing to me saying, oh my God, I heard you. And it, it, it was transformational. So. It's a very powerful medium. And I would like, I think from the point you were just making, video is another medium I'm kind of looking at. But for me, audio is like, it's a very um, intimate medium, right? Mm -hmm. It's like someone's in my ears talking to me. And everything else, every other sense is kind of switched off. And I'm just so focused on that voice and what it's saying. So audio is great for storytelling like you can like evoke so many things you can evoke memories and smells and scents and visual through the medium of audio so i'm very passionate about podcasting as the medium i'm completely new to it i don't you know i won a competition uh, about a year ago i pitched my idea for the podcast to spotify 
uh, and I won a competition for women of color podcasters. I think they had like hundreds of people apply and one of the few that got chosen. And then I created the podcast. So until then, I didn't even know what a podcast was, you know, and it, I, I feel like as women, when we are passionate and, and clearly you are about the work you do and Carol, you are about the work you do. I feel like the medium is secondary. We will find the medium, right? We will explore the medium, but it's the work that powers us and then goes on to the medium. So podcasting is absolutely going to be a lot of what I do. Uh, and I want to try and do things like live events as well with the podcast because I had a live launch and that was very popular. Lots of people came up um, where some of the people that I interview were live and we did a live episode where people could mm. ask questions. Mm. Um, so I will do more of those mm. as well. Um, video I'm exploring. I also, the other thing I'm actually doing, you were talking about technology is I'm taking the Salah Monologues workshop online. So because we don't know when the world is going to open up. So I want to work with women in the US and women in Singapore and women in India to do, to do the writing workshops because they're therapeutic. So when we sit down and we write, so say I wrote about the bus, I'd never spoken about it, you know, so writing and then other women saying, oh my God, I really hear you. That is therapy in some ways. And it, it kind of allows us to kind of vocalize and in turn, you know, messages that we've internalized up until that point. Mm. So I'm going to try and take it online um, and do it on Zoom. I'm mm. still exploring platforms, but I want to do Masala Monologues workshops online. So I can also open it up to a more global audience, I think. So that's kind of where I'm headed. So Masala Podcast, absolutely. It's coming out. I think season two will come out in September. Mm. And there's some amazing women. I interview a South Asian porn star for the first time. Uh, I've got a very a big female comedian. I've got somebody talking about menopause. She runs an organization. So lots of really interesting themes. Uh, and it'll start in September. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm so happy for you. And of course, you have me <laughs> to support Yay! you in reaching out to oh, South, Indian, uh, South Asian women uh, in, from Singapore. I have a lot of clients who are of um, South Asian descent origin okay anyway uh, i i can i can share it and uh i that think this episode this episode also i will share it with them and so we we need to be many voices uh, at, uh earlier today we also interviewed somebody uh who is indian in malaysia i'm sure she would support your uh, your podcast your work as well so so yeah you're so inspiring and animated and beautiful and oh. doing great work i think your your background your 20 years in advertising, copywriting, all these things that you've done have all kind of built up to your wealth of experience so that the quality of the work um, that you put out is going to be there. And that will, you know, there's so many people doing this work, but it needs to also be good. So I'm so I, happy I, and so proud of you. Uh, oh. Yeah, I, I will support you. And yeah, let's keep in touch for sure. That will be lovely. And I think it's so important that as women, we support each other. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we are battling so much, right? Whatever culture we come from, whether it's Singaporean, Chinese, you know, Indian, British, whatever. There's so many things we're battling with. And I think if we have a support of each other, I think it makes such a difference. And if we have a real sisterhood of women around the world, saying, oh my God, I hear you. And here's what I, uh, how I'll help you. And this is how you help me. And you know, we, we feel heard. I think it's transformational. Mm. Um, and I think that's the way forward. I really, really believe that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carol, would you like to kind of wrap up on your end? Yeah. Thank you so much, Sangeeta, for sharing so many golden nuggets. I have learned so much from you today just by talking to you. Um, you know, I, my, my, my biggest takeaway is, you know, we, our body is our temper and we, we are responsible to put all the good things inside and expert all, all the bad things. And then we need to have enough self-love so that we have more to give. And it is obviously that you have a lot of love to give, you know, whatever that you are oh. saying, whatever, whatever you have said to us today. It is just an emission of love. That's why I see that it's coming. Oh, and you're thank you. for other women as well. And I absolutely. All I can say is that you are one amazing woman that you are trying to change the world with little that you do. 
And you know, as my mother, I say, I, I, I want to be able to support you in whatever you do as well, because regardless of geographical location, regard, regardless of upbringing or culture, us women, we are, we are all being brought up in the same way. We are similar somehow, we are all one. And your voice is so important. And today I learned a lot from you that you, you need to first love to be able to give. Thank you for that. Thank you. Oh my God. Carol and Martha, you are both amazing. And thank you so much for giving me the space, um, for letting me speak freely. Uh, and I likewise, I feel the authenticity from both of you because, you know, there are a lot of people doing this kind of work in the world, but I think you both have this kind of real authenticity and love, I think. And that, it sounds really cliche, but that is the one thing that changes the world. You know, love, self-love, love for others. And that's, that's all it takes. It sounds really, really simple. But I feel like that's it. That really is it. But thank you so much. Yeah, for thank you. Uh, so share with us a little shout out. We're going to post all the links below. But give us yeah. a shout out about your, uh, your links. Yeah, yeah. So please follow my work on soulsutras.co.uk. Um, I'm on Instagram as soulsutras. Uh, I'm on Twitter as well as Soul Sutras. You can email me if you have any questions at South Asian women or women you want to share your experiences. You can email me at email at soulsutras.co.uk. So there are lots of ways you can get in touch. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear from you, whatever you want to share. It would be an absolute pleasure. Uh, follow my podcast. If you go on to either Spotify or Apple Podcasts, look for Masala Podcast. Uh, and you'll see all the episodes that are there. Have a listen again. Get back to me and tell me what you think. Tell me what you'd like to hear because I'm now creating season three as well. So I'd love to hear what you want to hear and create more content that you actually enjoy. So get in touch. Show me some love. Thank you so much uh, for coming. And we are definitely going to promote your episode, this, this episode in particular. Uh, and yeah, let's keep in touch. Thank you for coming. So this has been Bear All. Stay tuned to our, our, our other episodes. So yeah, bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Thank bye. You. Bye. Bye, Carol. <laughs>